Hello, my name is Michael Kane. I'm going to tell you something very special about this video. Not many people know that. Hello boys and girls and welcome back to my channel. You immediately recognize Michael Kane by his name. You know him by his photo. You know him by the sound of his voice. So I ask, what's in a name? Do you really know what his birth name was? Yes or no? Well, his real name is Morris Joseph Micklewhite, Jr. Not so appealing, eh? But take another name, one that really resonates. It's not a real person's name, it's a fictional name, but everybody knows it. It's been around on the silver screen for more than 50 years. I've always wanted to say this when I go to the check-in desk at the airport or at the reception desk in a hotel. Even though when I was young I had the looks to be, let's say, some type of a Bond figure, I had to use my own name. I could never allow myself to play a fictional character. I had to be the real me. The name's Bond. James Bond. Yes, that's my name. And you may well ask, what's in a name? Well... Let me tell you, it's your identity. It's how others know you. My external appearance has changed radically since that photo was taken in 1977. That's 53 years ago. But beneath that changed exterior, I'm still the same person. It's still me. So I would never change my name. Yes, your name is your identity. It's how people know you. It's what you are, it's your real self. How many of you are satisfied with your birth name? How many of you change your names to match your personality? What outrageous name would you have chosen if your parents had agreed? Think about it. Take for example my name. My name is Ivri Tasker, but I underwent two changes in my life. I was born in 1946 as Irving Tatarsky. My mother was in love with America and the composer Irving Berlin. So she called me Irving. I didn't like it at all. It wasn't me. Only my parents called me Irving. My pals at school called me Taz. One non-Jewish pal at art school, he called me Irvy Boy. Before emigrating to Israel, a friend of mine, she said to me, if you're going to live in Israel, then the name Ivri, not Irvi, is much more appropriate. And it stuck. I became known as Ivri. The language of Hebrew in Hebrew is Ivrit. Ivrit being the language. So I was a born again Hebrew. In 1970, when people heard me speaking English before I became fluent in Hebrew. They would say to me, Ivri, speak Ivrit. Six months after I was born in Liverpool, my father changed the family name by Dietpol. He had been born in Vitebsk, Belarus. His family had fled the pogroms when he was about six. The family joke is that he anglicised his surname from Tatarsky, then to Tarsky, then to Tasca, because whenever he said goodbye to anyone, they would respond with a wave of the hand saying, Tata Tatarsky. It's logical that once your identity has been established, your name should not be changed. At least that's my opinion. So now we get to the real point of this episode. What's in a name? What's a kibbutz? Why is it called kibbutz? Is it still a kibbutz? Does it justify the name of being a kibbutz? The Hebrew word kibbutz means a group or a gathering together. It explains the true inner essence of this communal society. 
And even though kibbutzim have changed and evolved from what they were originally, the heart and soul, the inside, remains the same. 90% of kibbutzim are no longer socialist communes of a hundred years ago. They have changed. They have evolved. They have reformed. Some have completely privatized. But each of these villages still goes by the name kibbutz. So we ask ourselves, is a kibbutz still a kibbutz? What's in a name? I say a kibbutz is still a kibbutz because firstly, the foundations and mindset. They grew and developed over three or four generations of like-minded people bonding together, working together and looking after each other. This is the built-in DNA of kibbutz, the group. This intrinsic DNA separates us from all other types of villages in Israel. Kibbutzim started out with the concept of all for one and one for all, and despite the changes, they still maintain that concept. From day one, they had joint ownership, joint ventures, and cooperative economic enterprises. At the beginning, they were all farming communities based on the land. This gave them a common physical and economic bond based on the soil. Farming as a joint venture is still today one element of the community glue that keeps us together. This is despite the fact that no more than 1% of its members work down on the farm. Other villages, as opposed to kibbutz, and I stress villages, were established as independent family units. They grew up organically. Many were established by the government to house immigrants in the 1950s. They were not established by a group, as a group, that had common values. They were just normal farming villages, and here I refer to Moshavim. The kibbutz concept started as a unified village. They were not villages with autonomous unit ownership. Without understanding the DNA of kibbutz, It may be very hard on the surface of things to distinguish between a reformed kibbutz and other communal villages or community villages, but there are many deep-rooted essential core differences. Over the last 30 years, other villages were planned and started within a communal framework such as what we call Kihilot Shitufiot, cooperative communities. They were initiated either by the government or by groups of people who decided to coalesce, to come together and to cooperate with each other. They did not start with farming as a joint venture. As far as I know, They do not own group land individually for joint venture farming. Yes, some have other cooperative businesses. The essence of Kehilot Shitufiot is more on the level of community services to engender a feeling of looking after each other, such as public gardens, education, childcare, health and welfare. Today in 2023, for example, Kibbutz Ivon in the Upper Galilee, with its 50 members, refers to itself as a Kehila Shutufit, a communal community, but retains the name Kibbutz. So you have Moshevim, Kehilot Shutufiot, and Kibbutzim. As I said, sometimes the apparent differences are blurred but there is a core, substantial difference. This is not just a matter of semantics, orientation, direction or philosophy. This is about the practical implementation of group actions 
on a day-to-day -day level. Yes, today the boundaries are sometimes indistinct to the naked eye. The edges are blurred, but there is a core difference between kibbutz and other communal settlements. The kibbutz is not a moshav. The kibbutz is not merely a kehila shoot of feet, a cooperative community. It may seem like that, but its intrinsic DNA is completely different. As the kibbutzim matured, they decided to provide more independence for their individual members, but that did not weaken the communal support system. In fact, it reinforced it. By being independent financially, members could give back to their communities by internal taxation. Although they have changed, they have not lost their true identity. The name tag remains the same. Second major element that demonstrates why kibbutz should keep its name is the safety net. Members are charged an internal taxation. Part of that revenue provides a support system as an economic wall to protect weaker members. This is called reshet bitachon in Hebrew, a safety net. A safety net does not exist in a kihila shitufit. If you go bankrupt in a kihila shitufit, your village bank will not bail you out. You are by yourself. You may be forced to sell your house and land to survive. This does not happen in a kibbutz. The third major difference between the kibbutz and other communal settlements and towns is its democratic structure. Daniel Ben Sefer explained this in episode 2, his heart is in the kibbutz. There is no greater democracy than that which is perpetuated in a kibbutz. Every member is a member of parliament. Go back to episode 2 and see Daniel. And now I will give someone else the last word on this issue. Pinchas Schwartz of the Ganyabet, my friend, strongly disagrees with me. And Pilkas and I, despite our long friendship, we have a different view and perspective on the kibbutz. So Pilkas, first for the viewers, just tell them a little bit about yourself, how you came to the Ganyabet, where you come from, how long you've been here. Okay, I came to Israel originally in 1965 for a year with a Sharut Lerham group. A year study course or work course? Year study. Yeah. That year became two years, and those two years became the rest of my life. I see. I arrived at Ganyabet in 1969, 1970. Yeah, so that was one year before me. And we were actually neighbors, right? Well, not only were we neighbors, but the interesting thing is that it's a very small world. We had the four bachelor rooms next to each other. There was a girl of my age, Margaret, on one side. Then there was me. Then there was another guy who was a divorcee. And at the end was where Pinchas and his wife. Now his wife, a very small world. She is a classmate of mine, Beryl, from Liverpool, from primary school and secondary school. So for more than uh, 50 years, we've been uh, neighbours and friends and known each other. So Pinchas. Exactly. Uh, as I was saying, I came, I came to Kibbutz because I had been in the city for a few years and wanted to try Kibbutz for what it was and for what it stood for. I'll use the word, unfortunately, things have changed. If you'd like to hear my <laughs> definition. Oh, definitely. You say, unfortunately, and I say, fortunately. So despite our difference of our opinion, and we haven't come to fisticuffs over it, Not yet. we're still friendly. <laughs> <laughs> so why do you say, unfortunately? Okay, let's, let's start off by saying, let's look at the word kibbutz. 
a kibbutz is not only is based ba it was based on an ideology. It was not only an ideology; it was a place to work and a place to live. Again, in my way of thinking, the problem is the ideology is gone. So therefore, what's the difference between living in Tel Aviv or in Kvam Nachem or in some small community? Once the ideology goes, so does the word kibbutz. Well, this is uh, the starting point of where we have a difference of opinion. I do not think that the ideology has gone I think the ideology has evolved and changed over the years from the original perception as you may have seen it or even as I may have seen it. But wh why do you say the ideology has gone? Basically the ideology, the ideology was built on the idea that all men are created equal, which means the importance was not what you are rather than who you are. Once the kibbutz started giving salaries and you start paying for everything on the kibbutz, it's gone. It it's, might be very nice, but call it a small community, call it a small town, but the word kibbutz, the word commune, the word community is gone. Uh, again, I disagree with you. <laughs> Uh, I travel around the kibbutzim and I look at my own kibbutz and I look at the 11 years that I was here and uh, you know you once told me in one of your our discussions that we are no longer a kibbutz do you still think that way after you made the change here in the Ganyabet? we are no longer a kibbutz okay so you stick to your guns <laughs> Again, it depends how you look at it. If, kibbutz, if as I think we once talked about, and you said the kibbutz, it's written down as a kibbutz. So therefore, it's simply a, a, yeah, a, semant a, a semantical word. Kvasab uh, is no longer a kva. Okay. And uh, so, uh, kva tink, kva, uh, tink uh, is no longer, the word is there. But in actuality, it's, it's just a word. I, I actually said that we are defined as a kibbutz legally in Hebrew, Agadah, Shitufit, a communal association and part of the kibbutz movement. And uh, you replied to me, you said, well, you know, wh what's in the word? Or I said, what's in the word? And what is in? It's just a semantical uh, definition. Uh, I say we are still kibbutz because kibbutz over the uh, about 110 years of development or so, 113 years, has changed and developed and evolved according to the will and desires of the people in that particular kibbutz. And nowadays, when did the Degan Yabet make the uh, change, what I call the refora reformation, or what others call privatization. When did you make the change here in the, the Ganya Bet? If what I remember, year? If, if About, I remember correctly, I don't remember exactly what year, but it was, it was a, a, a few years ago, Yeah, after you, a long struggle. I know, and after a lot of argument, and I remember that the, the Ganya Bet was one of the later kibbutzim to make a change, well after quite a few others. So the change you made here, you started giving different salaries according to the job where people worked and I presume that certain subsidies were withdrawn uh, so that people could pay for those facilities from the salaries etc. No, also, also the facilities were, were you, you paid for facilities. So you pay instead of being subsidized. So the idea was people originally thought great We'll now have salaries, we'll now have pocket money. Unfortunately, they didn't think that the more they earned, the more they would have to pay for things. So it was sort of a no-go situation. Okay, so you say that this uh, community, if you want to call it this now, is no longer a kibbutz. But I argue with you because there are still essential qualities and characteristics of a kibbutz even after a change, a reformation, that still make it different 
from other types of settlements and communities. Okay, I'll ask you a question. Name me one. You definitely ask me. Name me one. Okay. I would say, first of all, I'll take um, the example of different kibbutzim, of Amiyad or Yichiyam, where I was, or of my kibbutz, Kibat Haim where in fact you have a safety net, a security net, so that nobody will be dispossessed in any way from either their home or their health system, etc. Okay, again, the fact is that someone who lives in a city or in a small settlement, they all have some sort of security funds. No, no one has no one left a star, whether it's in Tel Aviv or it's in some small village. But they don't have it built in as a guarantee. They have to pay for that security. Uh, Whereas in their kibbutzim, there are elements which are outside of what you pay for in your community or service internal taxation. No, well, again, I say this the guarantee bit, unfortunately, without using any names, things are easily changed. You, you can use names, I don't mind. No, no, I mean, no, no, nobody no. is going to sue you. <laughs> no, you never know who. No, but as I just said, there are certain things, everything, it's very interesting. If we're talking about the Ganya bit, when the Ganya bit started the 1919. No, I don't mean when it began, when it started the campaign. Ah, to change. To, change, to make the change. And I'm, not, and I'm not joking, they put out a model, a model, oh, what's the word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got the other word in English. A model book of what this change would involve. Yeah, a yeah, 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 a, a yeah, yeah, blueprint, if you want to call it. 120 pages. Yeah. Of, of diagrams and yeah, it was really great. Yeah. Everyone read it, of course, and understood everything that was in it, of mm -hmm. course. And then they put out another one of only ninety-five pages of different categories and different. And everybody read it and everybody understood. Mm -hmm. And just as a personal matter, I asked ten people mm -hmm. what they thought, and everyone had read it differently. What does that mean? Everyone read it according to what they believed was mm -hmm. going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And then they put out a third book and said, well, we don't guarantee it, there might be changes in it, and of course there were. Mm -hmm. So basically what's happened, it's, it's, the expression is fool the enemy. Make it as complicated as you can, and then let the book Well, away. it's like, uh, in a way, trying to establish a constitution of an organization of a community. And I'm sure by publishing these first, second and third uh, booklets, there was a lot of uh, discussion and opinions uh, exchanged as it went on. How long over a period of time were you discussing to make the change until you made the actual reformation? If I'm, again, if I remember correctly, it came to the kibbutz uh, assembly I think at least three or four times that we voted down. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember because I was looking at the Ganya bet from a distance thinking, you know, are you going to make the change? Okay. It was, it, it was probably inevitable because at some point people were just getting tired. Mm. Uh, if I might add something. If you, if you, you can add one. You, you can add a... It, it, when the Ganya Bet began to take new members, half members, quarter members, one of the conditions was that the new members would not be able to take part in the voting for the change. For a certain period of time? Or no, no. Anyone who was, who yeah. was accepted... Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Point, okay? Yeah, yeah. Were yeah, few, yeah, 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 I got, got you. They weren't part were of the change conditions. itself. Right. They, there were a few other conditions, which at some point the Roshem, I don't I can't think of the word in English. The what? The Roshem Agudot. The uh, registrar of the Community Association of Kibbutzim. Registrar. After this was all over, the registrar decided that that particular issue was illegal. I see. Therefore, they could vote. Therefore, strangers who came out of nowhere mm. were now taking part in the decision to... 
Now let me ask you, were they complete strangers or were they returning sons and mixed. daughters? Anybody, a anybody mixed. who was considered a, a new member. Okay. So I agree with you that that was a difficult situation for outsiders to come in, be accepted as members and vote to change your life as a long time member. Yeah, you see, we agree. Something. Well, we agree on one thing, sir, and we're still friendly. <laughs> yeah, you see, it, it happens. The, the Messiah has arrived. Yeah. Uh, you know, they say that, uh, what is it, uh, Englishmen and Americans are divided by two things. One is the uh, Atlantic Ocean and the other is the language. But, okay, we agree. And tea and milk. <laughs> tea and milk. <laughs> are you milking first or tea in first? <laughs> or coffee? <laughs> No, this, this, and again, I say this. This final decision. Again, I'll be I'll be very yeah. brunt about it. Yeah. This final decision put the lid on the coffin. So, first of all, an interesting analogy: lid on the coffin. Okay, as you say. And for me, I see it another way. I see it as the change, which was like a spring for me when we made the change. I was like an uncoiled spring, as opposed to closing the lid on a coffin, I was up and away. <laughs> yeah, it depends on what side of the fence you're standing yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no, yeah. no question about it. And again, my, my, my only, I say, I, I, I am happy to what's happening here. I'm seeing young people that I don't know who they, who they are. The community, the community is growing. The community is growing but, because... Uh, Young people have come, have started coming back into the kibbutz. They've started again. Here's where we disagree. They've started coming back into the the Ganya Bet community. And again, I find it difficult to use the word kibbutz. I really do. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, but then again, to make myself feel better, I say, Kwa Samba is not really a Kwa. Kvaras Shmeriyahu is no These longer... These are big uh, cities and big uh, towns. No, no, yeah. the, yeah. but the word exists. So Kvar means, means it, village. It's a word, but it's a meaningless word. Mm. Okay, so it's a matter of, you know, what's in a name. And apart from what's in a name, what's in the community itself, whether you still have a community spirit... And you know, let, let me go back a bit. I mean, I'm prepared to compromise on the name and whatever name you want to call it, whatever it is. I, I see it differently because as I go around the kibbutzim, I still feel a strong feeling in kibbutzim of togetherness, community feel, feeling, a group, even though with their different opinions. And... Um, let me ask you about here in the Ganya Bet. You have uh, a new part, and it's now an old part of the kibbutz, which was the original extension of the kibbutz. And you let people build their own houses here who were not members of the kibbutz. Is that right? Uh, if I have it correctly. Over there. Okay. That way. You're talking about where Maoz lives and everybody else. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. This is something that was an econ was an, part of an economic the solution to an economic problem. I see. And what was the economic problem? As with most of the kibbutzim, the Ganyavet had a large debt to the banks. banks. To the banks. In the eighties and nineties. And as part of the arrangement, the money that they received for selling the, the property. Went to the banks, not to the kibbutz. So, in fact, this was an arrangement whereby the uh, banks were in on the deal. You said it. Yeah, I see. Now, if the banks hadn't been in on the deal and made conditions for you, would you have been able to repay that uh, debt to the banks if they hadn't uh, come along uh, with? It's hard to say, depending on the success of the financial success of the kibbutz. Well, then in those days you had the two factories, the agricultural sprayers and the silicon factory. In the 90s, I think, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what was the situation of those uh, two factories then? Were they making uh, good money? 
Again, without being liable yeah. for any losses. No, 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 no. He's got to sue you. The kind of spray is for as long as I can remember has been existing on a thread. I see. As an old traditional industry of manufacturing. Yes. Yeah. Agricultural spray. Yeah. And today's spray is sort of... Yeah, it's not a big business. It's not a big business, exactly. The silicone factory, again, it took, it took a lot of money to develop it and it was doing, I, I, for what I understood it was doing okay, but not okay enough. And you also then at some stage you uh, opened a silicone factory in India. This was a branch. A branch. Trying to spread out because, because of cheap labor. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, he would seem in a way have always existed on cheap labor. Originally it was us, you and me, and the earlier pioneers. Cheap labor because we didn't we didn't demand any salary, you know. And uh, then later on, there was a cheaper labor through different uh, ideological pioneering uh, youth groups. And then after that came thirty years of volunteers. And then after that, nowadays in Kibbutzim, the uh, Thai workers who come over from Thailand to work. I mean, very few kibbutziks. Small amount of work in agriculture nowadays. I think a, a small, a small percentage of Jewish people in Israel work in agriculture today. Well, you know, and as they everyone, say, everyone wants high tech. Uh, as uh, Alec Collins said in Farsi, no job for a Jewish boy. <laughs> I agree with him. <laughs> but you and I. We worked in agriculture the, here. Those are the you days. in the vegetable garden, me in the bananas, and we loved it. And those are the days when we, we, everyone, we did it. Yeah. We didn't think about it. No, because, you know, it was part of our, if you want to call it modus vivendi, this is what we came for, to help but not only build the land, because we weren't pioneers, but it's more or less building ourselves and feeling, feeling part of being a, an Israeli. Right, this is where we came from. Yeah. This, this was part of the life. Yeah. So the change was made. The banks came in on the deal. You opened up the new neighborhood over there about, probably about 20 years ago, I think. Be, yeah. And then since then, you've been extending the kibbutz with newer neighborhoods. And younger people have come back to the kibbutz here. Again, I, 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 you'll excuse me on that bit. Okay. You've come back to the guy you bit. Yeah. They've come back. They've come back to the Gandhi bit. Not to a kibbutz. Exactly. They've come back. The children of the kibbutz have come back to their home, which is called the Gandhi bit. But you say it's no longer a kibbutz. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and then, you, know, be clear. you know, I've had this opinion around. I mean, my neighbors in Givat Chaim Mulchad, they've uh, did a. Um, they've, they destroyed the old uh, house and built a two-story building. And uh, my neighbor, he says to me, you know, it's like a, a suburb of uh, Hollywood, Los Angeles or something. He, he, it's like, it's, he says, he doesn't look at it as a kibbutz. And in Kibbutz Yichiam, two weeks ago, I read the bulletin in Hebrew one of the original Chalutim, one of the original pioneers, a guy of 92, his name is Yoash. He says, we've made all these changes and we have crossed the red line. We are no longer a kibbutz. And this is the end of the kibbutz system. Do you agree with that? Or... Without giving you too much thought, I do, because that's what's yeah, happening. Yeah, I know, I'm asking for your reaction. We haven't, uh, we haven't prepared the script There is a frame, framework. No one is against change. Yeah. But again, there, there is a framework, and once you break through that framework, that's it. I don't care if people build 20-story houses in Tel Aviv. That's what they're building. Mm. But the, in the tradition, and then I use the word traditional keyboards, so I just doesn't, that doesn't go. So people came back to the Ganyabet and I heard the same in Kibbutz Yechiam. They said, we've come back to Yechiam. You know, we've come back to, we've come home. And whether you call it a Kibbutz or not. Now, I personally, I feel that there's still a lot of community and communal living that defines it 
and uh, maybe even a grey area between other communities. And I see Kibbutzim as an organisation and individually looking for new challenges as Kibbutzim that other communities don't look for. Anyway, I'll show all of this when I uh, uh, upload my interview with the community manager of Yichiam, and he'll, ex ex he'll explain what they're doing there. So, you know, we agreed to differ. <laughs> that's, that's we agreed of, to that's, disagree. That's part of life. Yeah. And as I was saying, yeah, just, just if you want to say in, in closing, the things that we do, do, do together and celebrate the holidays happens everywhere. Mm -hmm. Whether you live in, in again, you, know, you say Tel Aviv, where you live in, in, doesn't matter where you live. These are Israeli things. These are not specifically part of the kibbutz way well, of life. Well, you, in Tel Aviv, for example, you don't have the safety net and the security and the assurance that you have in a community like uh, the Gan Uh Again, I hate to disagree with you, but that's not necessarily, no, you can that's not, that's not necessarily true. The expression is, the proof, of, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. Yeah. Therefore, I wouldn't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily lie, because as soon as something happens, it's changed. <laughs> all right, okay, all right, okay then. Nothing is, nothing is written in blood. Well, if you talk about writing, I, when we originally sort of started having the difference of opinion, I said to you, as I said in my opening episode of this uh, channel, I said nobody ever wrote down the blueprint for the development of the kibbutz. And to go back all of those years, when the first person in the first kibbutz had a, his own electric kettle at her home, somebody turned around and said, we are no longer a kibbutz. Because, you know, they'd all eat in the dining room, they'd all eat in the clubhouse. Oh, it was a community like that. There were things, were, there were things that were against the, the... Again, I used the word ideology. It was. That's just the way it was. I agree with you there was an ideology People of were, a return to the land, of group labor and everything else. But there was no manifesto written down step by step. As you pointed out now with the change program, with the three books, as some type of um, written suggestion for a constitution. There was never ever, and even now, it, when you talked about the three books, I mean, it had to be written down so people would understand what the suggestions for change were. Okay, the problem was, It was a bit too complicated. I thought everyone, everyone who read bothered to read it, which mm. is always a, yeah. came to their own conclusions. And it's called, and I again use the expression, it's called fool the enemy. Mm. Because everyone read it and everyone came to their own opinions. There was nothing specific. And of course, at the end, it said everything could be changed. And of course, everything was changed afterward. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the problem. Again, I said, my, my, my basic problem is I'm, I'm happy with the community. I'm, Good to see strange new people coming in, but the word itself it sticks in my throat. I see, because you came here with a certain perception of what kibbutz is or was. What kibbutz was. I see. And you know, everybody has their own perception of life. So for example, if I even look at your house here, this lovely uh, salon uh, living room, my perception is looking that way towards the camera or the clock or looking over there to all the wall with the plates. But the perception of reality would be changed if I sat on that chair looking this way and it would still be the same room. So, you know, whatever people wrote in the formula to make the change, every, as you said, everybody saw it differently. Okay, so again, it's a, it's a problem. The problem with so many is simply the problem as I said, people were getting tired. And I use the word struggle, struggle because that's a popular mm -hmm. word today. Yeah. It, it, that's what it was. As for sure, in other kibbutzim also, the kibbutzim where the members were divided. Mm. What happened at the end was, as I put it this way, so, I'm, I'm happy for the place, I'm happy for the community, but somehow the word... The, the actual word of kibbutz sticks in your throat. To me, as I'm sure to others, the word kibbutz meant something. Yeah. 
Let me ask you, are you happier now after the change or were you happier before the change? Personally, in terms of way of life, I was much happier before because I knew what I, where I was. I knew where, today I don't know where I, I, don't, I really don't know where I am. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, after my life hasn't changed, except that I paid for this and I paid for that and I paid for this and I paid for that. Otherwise, my life hasn't changed. I see. Um, let me ask you, looking back on the years before you made the change and before you even had discussions about the change, or even before the financial crisis, were you a person who made any demands of yourself? You were married, and I, when I was here as a bachelor, I never made any demands of myself. And I was very prepared to live a modest light lifestyle in terms of cash in my pocket. Because there was nothing. <laughs> okay, but again, it's, so I, when I say myself, I'm, I'm a very simple, easygoing person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, there were two of us. Yeah. Uh, again, my wife came to kibbutz because of me. I see. Okay. So therefore, we did. There were there because were, when you there are, there are conflicts, but we were young, yeah, yeah. younger. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so you're 18 now. 18 now, yes. I was about 27. Then okay. So I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was again yeah. until I was married. I was, as the expression, free and fancy free. Yeah. So but you were just problems. a young bachelor enjoying the world and the kibbutz and, and the trying company. To, and, trying to, and trying to achieve something. That was. I see. And so what actually then pulled you towards living in a kibbutz? As, as I said, I, I came in Israel in 1965. In 1967, I, after the Six Day War, I went back to the States for a couple of months to pack up my meager belongings. Came back, lived in Jerusalem, did various jobs, uh, and in in 69, I decided enough of moving around, I want to try kibbutz. Yeah. And I'd been in the Ganya Bet for a Hebrew course in 1965 when I originally came to Israel. And I said, this is the time to try it, to really try it. Mm. And to be very honest, I think within, I'd say less than a year, I, I felt this was, my, this was part of my life. The other places were nice experiences. This was where I was going to make my life. Mm -hmm. And believe me, getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning means something. Oh yeah, I remember those days. I mean, the, before all the climate change, we used to get up at 4, and it was light at 4.15 in the morning. And we worked till lunchtime, and then we'd come home, have a rest, and then the day started again socially in the late afternoon. Therefore, very simple. Mm -hmm. on, on, on keyboards in those days, every day was two days. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Every time, yeah. The the afternoon, you know, with our watermelon parties on the lawn when they gave out uh, fruit once a week uh, free. But that was again. That was that was, that was life, and and, no, and most people didn't. Yeah. That was, that was life. As we yeah. Understood, that's life. And you, you and I, we mix with the volunteers. Oh yes. <laughs> But well, you were already married, and then the, yeah, with, with the exactly kids, our meet and the rest. And I all the time, I was just a bachelor. Gay, and the, the gay bachelor. Oh, no, the, yeah. 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 Well, you know, the happy gay, bachelor. Gay nowadays yeah. has another connotation. Yeah, I, just corre I corrected myself. You don't have to apologize because well, I, I corrected myself. I <laughs> no, correct. Okay, fine. So a, a, a footloose and fancy free bachelor and a footloose and fa fancy free married person in many ways and just enjoying the quality of life of kibbutz. That's what it was. That's what it was. But again, when I think about it, that's what it was in Israel. Yeah. Well, Israel too changed after the Six Day War. And then in, 10 years later in 77 after the right wing government came in and threw out the Labour Party and we, we lost our support system in the Kibbutzim. Well, yeah. all, part, all, part of the, all part of the big picture. Okay, so Pintas, do you have anything else to say about the Kibbutz nowadays that you would like to I change think, or restore? 
I'd like to rest restore everything, but I'm talking about, I'm talking about today, and I'm, I'm realistic. Again, I'm very happy what's going on here. I see new faces, even though I don't know who they are. Yeah. Uh, but again, uh, and, I, and I repeat myself on this issue, if I had a giant eraser, I would erase the word keyboards. Call it a community settlement, call it a community, call it... This is the thing that, this is the, the chicken bone that's stuck in my throat. All right, well, we'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay? <laughs> well, excuse me. <laughs> All the best. That chicken bone. <laughs> the, the chicken bone, bone. okay. <laughs> Maybe we're going to find a surgeon for you. <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, Pintas. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Beryl, my classmate, who's over there. She's out of uh, sound and Biting sound. her tongue, sure. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it. Thank, thank you. you. All the best, kid.